Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to see what the world looks like through atheist eyes. I'm Frank Zindler from American Atheist Press, and once again today I will be your host for another program dedicated to showing the world what it looks like to atheists and other skeptics and free thinkers. Today's program, entitled Life with Josh McDowell, will be the second in a series of five interviews I've had the pleasure of conducting with Dustin Lawson, an amazing man whose career has shifted from being a professional trainer of lions and tigers to being a preacher, an understudy to the famous evangelical apologist Josh McDowell, and then to being a God-free author of novels and nonfiction works. He now joins us in our effort to bring reason to the world and to bring the world to reason. Let's listen now to the story of his life with Josh McDowell. Welcome again to our interview with Dustin Lawson, the former Tiger trainer. <coughs> we, in the previous program, brought you up to the point in his career where he joined the famous or notorious, depending upon your viewpoint, uh, Christian apologist, Josh McDowell. And uh, today, uh, I want to talk with Dustin to find out just what all he did uh, in this very unusual employment. Okay, take it away, Dustin. Uh, yeah. So, in all, after the summer, after graduating college, in August, flew to Dallas to begin my job with McDowell. And for a year, I was his personal assistant. And I, just a, a brief summary, lived on a tour bus and an airplane, traveled over 100,000 miles all over North America from, I mean, Canada, 44 of the 50 states, Mexico, and then Israel, Jordan, and then Poland, England, and France. And I was just a small town country boy that hadn't mm -hmm. done a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. And then that year happened. Yeah. Now, do you I, have any, any videos or anything, any photographs of those tour buses and, and, and that? Sort of thing that we oh could, yes definitely we can I we can we can show pictures. them on this show yeah, yeah, definitely, we can we can definitely. edit them in uh, I have a lot of amazing yeah. pictures from that okay year. great great uh, it was a team on the road of uh, seven of us the driver Josh his best friend who kind of an assistant the two interns and then the road manager and the guy in charge of all Josh's resources on mm. the road mm -hmm. all of his books and talks and everything. And it was an amazing team, an amazing time, and I mean, we would wake up 5 o'clock and go until 1 o'clock in the morning, mm. and I'd wake up not knowing what city or state I'm in, <laughs> and, which was a fun experience, yeah. and we were in, I mean, Josh would speak for three hours in the morning to teenagers and three hours in the evening to their parents, and there was a lot of single, just one talk things, events as well, at conferences mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. or radio shows, or television shows or magazine interviews specifically i kind of ran the ran and helped make the powerpoints for his talks run the music uh do some public affairs media relations stuff for him help edit some of his books and kind of filter because people were always handing him manuscripts and mm -hmm. stuff like that mm -hmm. and saying josh please read this and i would be the guy who would read it see if it had any, enough credibility to hand off yeah, the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just a lot of, I mean, I just helped all the, the team, and it was just there to learn from him, to become, to train, to become mm -hmm. another him, basically. Now, did you get to do any speaking during that period? Not with him, but on my time off, I would oh. go, like I, I would speak at a couple of different colleges mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then speak at various churches as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it was an amazing year. I mean, I thought, I mean, I, it seemed like everything had come together the divine will all the other obstacles have been cut away mm -hmm. and my have i was getting that single mind focus that this is uh, all i was going to do was preach the gospel and write books just like josh mcdowell and be yeah. the next one yeah but then uh and let me say this about josh josh is one of the hardest worker the hardest working man i've ever met great father great husband great boss and he's one of the few people that you can say 
that he is the same guy backstage as he is on stage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So not a politician. He's genuine. Type. He's genuine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. And we just ha- began to have some fundamental disagreements. Yeah. Now, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, on your travels, you got to the Holy Land. I did. And tell us a little bit about that and what you experienced. And well, Growing up in the church, I mean, going to Jerusalem is a dream that you, you want to go and walk where Jesus walked, where King David walked, King Solomon, where Samson pushed the pillars right. over. Right, yeah. And all these, you want to go and see it and not just it have be some, I don't know, dream in your mind. And I spent a week in Jerusalem and it was by myself most of it because I, 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 we were going to the Middle East and I went there early because I, I had to go to Jerusalem and mm-hmm. it was an amazing time and it did help me put I mean make it more real mm-hmm. but that might have actually been where some of the doubt subtly started yeah really like I, I went to the garden tomb which is supposedly where Jesus' body yeah, this was is laid according to the gospel and, of John right? right yeah laid and resurrected and as I stood in the tomb, I thought going there and standing in that tomb would yeah. make it... Yeah, yeah. Would like You'd solidify. have a religious experience. Yeah, yes, it would yes. solidify the conviction, and that would be like a cornerstone moment that I could yeah. look back on. But it might have actually been the opposite, because I, I realized being there that that did nothing to validate mm-hmm. that it mm-hmm. happened 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, it, I mean, it was no, there was no evidence at all just standing in a tomb like that. Yeah, and I begin. I mean, I didn't. I don't know. I, I look back and I think that might have been once you once I was there and just realizing that I can't. This does not in any way prove that the man named Jesus was laid here. Yeah, and yeah. That it could have happened. But yeah, but I it didn't really yeah. prove anything. How right. do we know it was his tomb? Right, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it turns out by the way that uh, that tomb was carved out of, of a rock area and there had originally been a whole bunch of tombs mm-hmm. and they all were discovered empty by the way. Right, right. <laughs> but in order to keep up the facade of the empty tomb, right. all of the other tombs right. were carved away wow. and eliminated. I did not know so, that. So yeah, so that wow. so that um, I mean it does feel as if that would have been the one because it sure. talks about Golgotha being the yeah, skull. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. Four fifty yards away yeah. around the corner, there is a. It looks like a huge skull yeah, right yeah. on the side of the mountain. So yeah. it does feel like that. Yeah. If, if, and I understand, yeah. but yeah. still, there, there there were just quite a few tombs, all right, real side by side mm-hmm. there. Right. And uh, these, of course, were discovered by quote discovered by. Um, Constantine's mother, Helena. <laughs> and uh, apparently when she went to the Holy Land, um, uh, of course, Constantine the Great was the first Christian emperor. Um, uh, he uh, he uh, was not a very nice person, uh, he, at least not to his family, but he didn't harm his mother anyway. <laughs> he was good to his mother, <laughs> killed everybody else. But he, he Even was, Hitler liked he, his mom, I think. He was, <laughs> he was good to his mother. Um, and uh, she went to the Holy Land, and of course the tour guides, um, you know, were happy to uh, satisfy every one of her requests. Oh yes, and here's the <laughs> real cross. Uh-huh. They just dug it up, you know. Uh-huh. And oh my goodness, this is the cross on which Jesus was crucified. And then when she went to Bethlehem, they showed, you know, where the where the cradle had been, and and and, and all of these sites. And so none of these holy sites, um, I don't think there's any exception, not any one of them can be dated to have been a Christian veneration site Mm. before the time of Constantine, that is, before the 4th century. So that, and that was true of Nazareth and all of these places, yeah. So most of the geography of the New Testament is fictional. you know what? I, I've heard this. I heard this argument as a Christian, and the argument that I came back with was, yes, but if the Christians had venerated those sites before Constantine, they would have probably been persecuted for it. That yeah. was my answer. Yeah, my yeah, answer. yeah. I mean, I mean, maybe that's legitimate, but at the same time, yeah, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, we now know that there were very, very few persecutions. Right. Uh, that I do the think whole that, thing, I do think the, the whole thing about persecution. 
uh, was largely, not entirely, but, but largely mm -hmm. made up for all the persecutions before the time of Domitian. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the case of the persecution under Nero, uh, we only have one manuscript of Tacitus to indicate mm -hmm. that that ever happened. And Tacitus didn't mention that in his other writing cover covering the same period. And there's a lot of argument that that particular thing of Tacitus is a forgery. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, 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 and one other thing, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, I meant this to be your show, not mine, but let me <laughs> blab on. Um, uh, the word martyr in Greek uh, originally meant simply a witness. And I believe that in the original, in the earliest church, there was a church office called the Office of Martyr. Mm -hmm. And this had nothing to do with laying down your life. This was witnessing that you had seen the, the living Jesus, right. the risen Jesus. Wow. These would have been like prophets. We know that, there, that the, the Office of Prophet was one of the offices in the early church. But uh, the um, martyr was somebody who had had a vision of Jesus, or of, of the risen Christ, presumably, and would be a witness, a martyr, martyros in Greek. And then, when there really were persecutions, mm -hmm. and these people were witnessing for Jesus, <laughs> then, indeed, they gave up their lives. And so, at that point, the word martyr took on a completely different meaning, but its present-day meaning. But originally, it had nothing to do with giving up your life, witnessing, you know, uh -huh. with your life. But anyway, wow. so you you went to the garden tomb, and where else did you go? Oh, my favorite place was Petra Jordan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some places, like most places that you hear about, and you don't live up to expectations. Yeah, so Going yeah. to Petra, even President Obama said when he visited there, it yeah. exceeded expectations. It yeah. Was that incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then we went to Poland, and uh, Josh talked to, I remember, about 15,000 teenagers, and I think about four or 5,000 of them went forward after his talk to become a Christian. My goodness, it does was, he speak Polish? No, but he has a, a very good translator. Oh. <laughs> that, that, that same translator every time he goes to Poland. Oh, my gosh. And he, he, uh, I mean, that guy was really, he was really good. He was right there, right uh -huh. with Josh, gave the same level yeah. of emotion. Oh, my gosh. Uh, then hung out in France for a little bit, Paris, that was just more for fun in between before coming back home how but, does a christian have fun in paris i'm curious you see the sights okay <laughs> and i had a glass of wine <laughs> oh my goodness yeah, that was my first taste of alcohol oh really yeah. oh that's right your your churches would not use real wine for communion yeah but we in paris we were meeting with uh someone who worked for josh mm -hmm. and he's a Frenchman, so he drinks wine, and so he ordered us all a glass of wine. And I just let it sit there for the entire meal and looked at it, and then finally I, I downed it. And that was, I mean, I was such a lightweight. It was the first time I'd ever drank alcohol, so yeah, it kind yeah, of affected yeah. me a little bit. Yeah, but I came back, and then a couple months more of touring with Josh before I had, I guess, what I would say that that seminal moment night where the doubts truly began. You were um, in the tour bus, you told me, I think? Or, well, or, eventually. I mean, oh. I mean, to Josh's credit, he would teach teenagers every day to challenge all authority. Mm -hmm. Respectively, mm -hmm. challenge all authority. Mm -hmm. Even your beliefs. Yeah. And he basically said to me as well, as like, if you want to be another me, you need to challenge all authority, including your beliefs, because you'll come away from it with greater conviction. And, I mean, I was hesitant to do that, and I didn't really directly do it. It just kind of started happening. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. One night, I think we were in California, Josh was talking to parents, and he was going through some of his arguments for the resurrection. And I'd heard him say these arguments hundreds of times, and I'd used them myself hundreds of times. And this specific argument, he said, a person doesn't die for a lie that right. they know is a lie, so the disciples must have known the resurrection happened because they were eyewitnesses and they would have not willingly died for their belief in the resurrection if it had not happened. So it must have happened. And I, I mean, it sounds good. It sounds airtight until you start to look under the surface. And then it just hit me when I was backstage listening, running the sound of the PowerPoint. 
that argument is skipping steps. You first have to prove that the disciples and Jesus even existed, and then you have to prove that the disciples did in fact die specifically for their belief indeed, in the resurrection. Indeed. And you can't prove that they existed, and you can't prove that that's why they died. And so the argument has no validity if you can't prove those two things. And then that night on the tour bus, I kind of went to bed early. Um, I was on the, the top bed, pulled my curtain back, and just sat there in the dark and went through dozens and dozens of different arguments that I'd memorized and just realized that they all were like that, that they were skipping steps in the process of being able to prove something. And I could just see that night my career slowly beginning to crumble because I was going to bring people to Jesus through reason, through these arguments, and they weren't sounding very good anymore. They didn't hold water anymore. And I didn't tell Josh about it for the last month. And we kind of had a talk at the end, like, what happens now? And I I just, I was still kind of numb and dazed. I was like, I, I just, I got to go think without telling him. And that ended up going into a 10-month period of me challenging everything I'd grown up believing. All right. I think we will tantalize our viewers by breaking off at this point. And in our next uh, installment, we will examine more closely uh, what went through Dustin's mind and how he broke the news to Josh McDowell. And um, we'll take it from there when we get there. Thanks for tuning in, and tune in again next time.